Welcome to Cannabis 360, your source for cannabis and psychedelic industry news, interviews, and insights. Visit Canna360.ca and sign up to receive free access to the entire Cannabis 360 catalog. In this episode of High Fidelity, we speak with Daniel Loretti, CEO of GrowDog, a revolutionary app that utilizes artificial intelligence and academic research to quickly diagnose unhealthy cannabis plants. Daniel recognized a lack of available resources for accurately diagnosing issues with cannabis plants, leading him to discover an app designed for detecting weed and corn diseases. He saw the potential for a similar tool that could be applied to cannabis, and thus, GrowDoc was born. During our discussion, we explore how artificial intelligence is used to diagnose unhealthy cannabis plants, the accuracy of the app, and specific challenges related to identifying plant diseases and pathogens. Tune into our latest episode to learn more about the innovative technology behind GrowDoc and how it's changing the cannabis industry. Okay. All right. Welcome, Daniel. Uh, how are you today? I'm doing good. Thanks for asking. How are you? Yes, doing well, thanks. Great to have you here on High Fidelity. So um, I'm here with Daniel Lorette. Um, he's CEO at uh, GrowDoc. And so GrowDoc is an AI company. Um, and he'll go over in more detail in terms of what they're all about. Um, so yeah, let's start first with that. Like, tell me a little bit about GrowDoc, the app, how that idea came about and sort of walk me through the journey in terms of how you got it uh, off the ground. Yeah. So, uh, it started, I was, uh, I have a tech background, so I'm working at this, uh, startup, uh, and, uh, I'm finding automation software and I end up stumbling on this, uh, company doing, uh, wheat and corn disease identification. And, uh, it looked like they were having lots of success. So I, uh, okay, and I dabbled in. I was like, well, you know, cannabis just became legal. This is uh, no, about November 2018. So I'm like, cannabis just became legal in Canada. You know, uh, what, like, has anybody kind of done this with cannabis? And uh, I kind of looked into it and there's a few failed attempts, but nobody was kind of doing it at the moment. There was no uh, current, currently uh, somebody running this as, as a business and kind of going after some the research to back this uh, this AI machine learning. So that's kind of how it started. And from there, uh, I had no experience in machine learning, but uh, I'm not one to let that stop me. So I, I went on every weekend uh, from basically 4 a.m. to 7 a.m. Uh, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, it's, I think it's like six to eight weeks. It took me to uh, first get the data, get a data set, uh, start machine learning. Uh, the algorithm ran into a ton of problems and, you know, just dabbled and tried to fix it. And then by the end, I had, uh, you know, working just console in the back end where you could send a picture and it would tell you what, what it predicted. And then from there, I knew it was, it was a viable thing to, to do. And, uh, I just kept going, coming from there. So I put up my, all my finances and, and, uh, organized kind of a plan to, to quit my job and then, uh, just kind of went that way and then, uh, saved up some money and then started. It. So just jumping right into the fire, eh? And sort of right in the fire. Boot, yeah. Bootstrapping it a little bit yourself and, uh, yeah. kind of learning as you go but yeah that's uh that, that's super cool um so like ai seems to be such a big topic right now with like chat gpt and so i thought it really was like the perfect time to have this conversation so we're hearing a lot more about ai in general and mm -hmm. tell me more like about how ai fits into the grow dog app itself and you know, why is that such an integral part of it? And is this really what makes it, you know, really like an innovative technology that we're seeing in the space right now? Right. So to start off, to, to, to explain how it fits. Uh, so for the, the people that really use the computer and spreadsheets and Word, uh, you could basically say it's the control F. So the fine for plant problems. So you'll paste the picture, it'll find which one it is. Uh, and then in the other people that are just, you know, normal day-to-day uh, -day life is basically like the Shazam. You take a picture, it figures it out that, that same same way. Um, so it's a, it's a core part because the AI is learning each symptom of each different problem. Uh, and that's where we are working with research facilities um, to manipulate and experiment on plants to have one variable. Uh, so stripping out key nutrients or inducing a pathogen on the plant, that sort of thing. And then we document those at, you know, thousand intervals of uh, different angles, uh, you know, different lighting, that sort of thing. And then that's all what the machine uh, basically builds itself on and learns from. So basically, it's like you, you would have this handbook and um, you, you would have all the pictures of what each problem could look like. And it's basically when you ask this person, they would be able to flip through the handbook within milliseconds and figure out which one it is and point you to the right one and show you what what the, the images look like as well. So that's kind of in a short term, what we do and how that 
you know would be the the use case if it was a, a real person with that type of uh of information mm -hmm. yeah i love the comparison between like control f and like use that all the time and then shazam 2 is actually something i use all the time as well so it's a great way to sort of understand you know how it works and then you mentioned there sort of like finding the right one so like ensuring that the data that you're gathering is is scientifically accurate and and that you know people are getting an accurate reading of of what's being identified is obviously like a critical component of the app so like tell me a little bit about how that functions like you mentioned it a little bit there but like how does that really work yeah so for us when we started is that that was a crucial piece because it's like how do you differentiate yourself from a great working product with backed by credible data versus just something that's bro science that oh we believe it could be this or just because we had these symptoms and we added this fixed it right and it's not that's not always the case there's could be secondary variables like humidity temperature in the background that were fixed during that time and you believe it's a nutrient issue when it was maybe your environment so the crucial thing about these research facilities is consistency and the lack of the the specificity um basically like the variables uh, so there's there, everything is controlled uh, and when it's done, it's done at a three interval. So you have um, so just to explain what we have going on right now at Niagara College. Uh, we have them doing uh, a trial on boron. So we've got three control plants or just the healthy plants. And then they're going three plants with boron completely eliminated from the formula. Um, so the, the, you're going to see deficiency symptoms there. And then we have the toxicity, which is they, I think now it's about nine times the, the, the recommended level of boron. So that's kind of what we're seeing. And that's what we are, are doing when we're taking pictures of those things, those symptoms. And that's what's populating the app in the back end. So the app is, or the AI is well fit to understand what it really looks like in terms of this is this uh deficiency or this is this toxicity because it's really been trained on the exact um scientific uh trial uh, and then that's not only do we do it at one facility we always try to repeat the experiments at multiple facilities so we are working with uh the community college of new brunswick where it's a, a more of an applied research or more a phd um type of people that are are conducting these studies and we're use, working with uh, the university of moncton and we're working with uh, colorado state as well so most of these times like uh for example um we've done potassium deficiency uh two times uh powdery mildew has been done at two facilities uh, and then that sort of thing for example so we keep doing those and that that just keeps happening so we get one different cultivars that are uh, exposing those symptoms and two, we're, we're doing the repetition to really see, okay, these are the crucial uh, symptoms of the, the deficiency. Mm. And so is that sort of part of it, like not being entirely crowdsourced so that you are having these sort of like specific studies, like done under sort of a standardized method? Is, is that part of it basically? Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the crowd, it, it would work if there was previous research done, right? The, you, we all know that cannabis has been illegal forever. So research has been limited. And that's kind of the, the differentiator of taking cannabis to do the disease, disease diagnosis versus doing tomatoes, let's say, where there's tons of universities that have studied nutritional impacts and that sort of thing, right? So this is where we're doing this to have that credible base and to know what it actually looks like in terms of all the different types of symptoms from the early stage to the late stage so that we can then train the machine and then kind of use the crowdsourcing afterwards to add on to what we already know for a fact is this because we see the symptoms, right? So almost like setting that baseline. Basically. Right, exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay, cool. And now like to get into sort of like the nitty gritty of the app itself and how it functions. So like, how does it work? Like you mentioned Shazam, is it as simple as like you take a picture and you're instantly given uh, a diagnosis? Um, and like what happens afterwards? So like once a diagnosis is received and the, and the grower takes that information, like are they given instructions in terms of like how to resolve that issue? Like how far does the app go? Is it just identifying it or are there sort of like steps that happen afterwards to help, you know, remediate the situation basically? Yeah, so it starts off just as Shazam, you take a picture, you get an identification. And then on the app, uh, what we are doing one is the app is going to show you the potential. So it's it could be there's some problems that look very similar. Um, so it could give you I believe it believes it's this or this. And then afterwards, we've added videos and pictures for you to check for yourself and be like, No, I think it matches more on potassium, for example, versus light burn or something like that. Um, and, and in terms of afterwards, 
it will suggest you what steps to take next uh, according to um, what we believe is the proper order of uh, resolving a problem. So meaning, let's say you've got a calcium deficiency, the first thing to, re to resolve it is not add CalMag. Um, that's more of step four or five. First one is, you know, you're going to check your humidity, humidity and your VPD. If those are out of sync, uh, those can cause your, your calcium to be locked out. So it's available in the plant. It's just not being uptaken by the plant. So um, there's that. We do uh, pH issue, check your pH, uh, and then as well as, you know, just your environment and lighting and that sort of thing. So we, we have kind of a checklist uh, for you to go through first before you then move to uh, adding some, some calcium. Um, if, if that's really the deficiency that you have, because there's other uh, potential causes as well. Nutrients work together. So sometimes you may have a lockout, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then sir, you, you sort of mentioned it there. So like they might take a picture and, you know, there are um, diseases and pests and issues that do look very similar. So again, going back to sort of the accuracy piece, like how do you guys measure that accuracy? Like you know, are you seeing sort of a significant improvement as you're getting more pictures and more entries and the studies that you guys are doing? Mm -hmm. So like because of these like, you know, potentially hundreds of different diagnoses um, that that could be a, a possibility when people su submit the picture. So like how is that being gauged over time? Yeah. So uh, one, we measure uh, the actual scans that come through and the diagnosis. So we have multiple process for uh, different types of accuracy that we measure. Uh, so one, we measure basically what the uh, machine believes it is. So the machine does its own analysis to, to show an, an accuracy there. Uh, so we do that type of measuring. We measure per each uh, individual problem. So we measure accuracy on those. And then as well as we measure accuracy on the actual scans in the app. So the, in the app, we will look at what the machine said, if it's uh, basically that those end up to being a true or false or a maybe. Uh, there's mm -hmm. still some symptoms that we have not done um, the extensive research on, uh, and sometimes that just the, um, and then this is, we're opening a can of worms because the research never ends really. Cause if we talk about, okay, you added too much of two nutrients, two toxicities, then that, that might cause specific symptoms because those are interacting. So like, that's a, a long-term term plan for us, but we are kind of diagnosing what we, that the app is going to see. And that's kind of, uh, our approach for, for our, our accuracy and, and measuring that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe let's dive into like specific plant diseases and, and pests and, and pathogens. And like, I guess first with disease and pathogens. So like, what are really some of the common ones that, that you're seeing in cannabis that you're seeing in the app and that you're, you're seeing people submit and um, what are some of those underlying causes generally speaking? Yeah. Uh, so I think the main ones that we're seeing, I would say is a magnesium deficiency and uh, powdery mildew. Uh, so those seems to be very, very common. So magnesium deficiency can be anything from uh, the low root temperature. Uh, so under 15 Celsius uh, at your root zone, it starts locking out magnesium. Uh, magnesium really works with uh, calcium as well. So if you're locked out because of your humidity or calcium get locked out, it'll lock out magnesium. Uh, and then similar thing to uh, toxicity of uh, potassium or phosphorus, those will lock out magnesium and calcium and other ones as well. So there's a lot of, you know, issues that can be caused, can cause magnesium deficiency. And these are all things that we mentioned in our app as well, and kind of that checklist uh, realm. Uh, and then as, as terms of, uh, of powdery mildew, that's normally either, you know, it could be you bringing it in or your dog, and that those could be, and then normally the spores are kind of always out there, uh, but it's really your environment that causes that issue. Uh, and then, and then let's say either you, you fix your environment and you start remediating the problem or your environment keeps it thriving. So. Yeah. Powdery mildew is a big one. Like that's one that I've seen, like even from personal experience, like being at different facilities and stuff and one that they're really struggling with. And I know like it tends to be worse depending on sort of what province you're in and, and where you're located. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've heard personally, like, once you have powdery mildew, it's almost impossible to get it out. I'm just curious, like, what, what are your thoughts on that? Like, is it something that like can be fixed or is it something like once you have that problem, it's really just like suppressing it as much as possible, you know? Yeah, I think it, it uh, at the time, I think it's suppressing it as much as possible. I think we we do know, uh, just working with Naira, they mentioned there's some cultivars that they have that are terrible for powdery mildew they'll just like collect it like nobody's business and others 
that don't not so much it's not that bad uh and you know so that's kind of you know what cultivars you have will definitely determine what your your ease of remediation um but what I, i've spoken to to a guy from quebec who's who's has has this light that can kind of is a uv light that can see in the cracks and he he says he can see we can see the the spores of powdery mildew if there were in there so it's like maybe you cleaned your whole facility but there's a few cracks here and there that some spores still are, are there and then all of a sudden your ventilation just kind of brings mm -hmm. that back in right yeah so, yeah and, and we do know that uh, i think it was copper that came with the biological that can eat powdery mildew spores uh so i think they won an innovation we were just speaking about that last week so i think they won a, an innovation on, on biopest but that's something that uh we're looking forward to hearing more about and seeing how that that goes but yeah that could be big yeah yeah, yeah. Cool. overall though we've we've heard a lot of people though powdery mildew seems to be pretty prevalent uh all around yeah and, you know, on, on that topic in terms of like plant symptoms, like, are there any that you find are particularly difficult to identify? Like you mentioned, a lot of them like look the same. Um, so like, are, are there some that are, again, difficult to identify and then also too difficult to distinguish one from the other? And, and which ones are those typically? Uh, I mean, I guess that would depend on what your level is of growing uh the novice versus the the master grower for example uh you know when you're starting off novice like nitrogen and iron could be very similar but uh as the master grower knows like it's one starts at the bottom the other one's at the top that type of thing or the the yellowing starts at the base or the tip right so there's difference there's extra and that's kind of how we're continuing to progress along with our accuracy we're kind of training the ai as well on top of what what we're doing with the data set, we're training it on those types of determining those symptoms to put those together to formulate a, a more accurate answer. Mm -hmm. So there's things like that. And then there's things like uh, spider mites and thrips are uh, somewhat similar. Uh, however, uh, you know, once you get an eye for it, you can, you can pick it off off the bat. Spider mites are more of a, a white circle, uh, more of bite mark. Thrips are more of a pattern. -y. They'll go and then in thrips, they start glossy and then they turn into white. So Kind of similar there as well and those are things that we keep working on with the, the machine depending on on what stage uh the machine if it, later stage could be tricked between believing it was thrips or spider mites but in a sense we're still leading growers to um looking under their leaves because those are very tiny insects that uh are hard to to see um so the, the the spots are usually what uh what attracts the naked eye and um and then there's something done about it mm -hmm. yeah it's kind of like um to you just sort of like eventually you 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 can see it um over time and stuff and i i almost could make the comparison too with powdery mildew like people yeah. when they first see powdery mildew might just be like oh that's just super crystally yeah. like cannabis right and you're like no, no, no once no. you see it like you learn pretty quickly like definitely yeah. not right yeah yeah and that's the thing for us what we, like in terms of um questioning the ai is like those easy ones that humans can uh, like afterwards a few times you see it you can easily recognize it those are the easiest ones for the ai to pick up on and, and mm -hmm. diagnose properly right so that's kind of of, of the approach too and that's that's our, our focus to to get those ones really honed in on and then we move forward afterwards on the, the more difficult ones the more yeah yeah and is it really like you know we're, we're seeing with ai and people are like the more you feed the ai the better it gets and like has, has that really been your experience too like has it just been sort of exponential in terms of like how much better it's gotten since you first launched the app absolutely absolutely yeah. day day night um you know because uh, now it's it's to the point when it, it's a it's a vicious cycle because it's like at some point you your ai starts being good enough that um with thresholds we can set okay run on, on on the data set of scans and then rerun and then afterwards when we start getting to checking little symptoms then we can kind of it speeds up our data collection basically uh it'll just say okay these ones we believe is this at this accuracy and then we can look through it as humans and then be like yeah those are good and then later on once we i would say probably three to five years from now uh the problems that will really define on it the ai will almost be able to determine which ones are actually matching and just add those to the data set. So no more human interaction. They call that like the, the unsupervised learning, which is just AI learning from itself, basically. But mm -hmm. that will happen for us. It's just a matter of continuing that data collection through uh, our cannabis research. Um, but, you know, we know for a fact after we've conducted magnesium deficiency three times, and if anybody scans it, that is automatically with high accuracy that like picked off like there's no there's no getting that wrong and we we were even at the lab ourselves 
and we scan 10 pictures and it's 10 out of 10 at different angles, different uh, stages. So, you know, we know for a fact, once we hit that about thousand to 2000 pictures threshold, it gets really high in accuracy. And then afterwards it's just adding those little add-ons to, to help, um, you know, formulate a better accuracy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. And, uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm sure there's a, it sounds like, like even as you describe it, like there's a lot of work that you're doing on the back end, but like, it is pretty cool that you're having that, that you sort of have a technology that's almost making itself better over time. Right. So yeah. 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 Um, just sort of that like self-sufficient nature of it is, is pretty fascinating. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've seen on, on Brodoc, um, you guys have like a great blog there and I've seen you guys sort of dive into the concept of nutrient toxicity, yeah. um, and how, and sort of this idea of how imbalances, um, can eventually lead to deficiency. So can you tell me what you mean by that? And like, I guess first, like what is the concept of nutrient toxicity? And then again, how does sort of imbalances go to deficiencies and what you mean by that? Yeah. So, uh, so basically when you start growing cannabis, let's say you're growing hydroponically, you're usually doing bottled nutrients and within the bottled nutrients that you're using, the fertilizer company has kind of tested it out and they have come up with a formula, uh, mixed with all the different nutrients that the cannabis plant needs for the different stages. And then you're just applying what they have formulated to be the best solution with their nutrients. Um, so a toxicity, uh, in terms would be, uh, normally in that hydroponic aspect would be giving too much of that formula. So you're no longer at the right ratio. You're just giving too much that the plant can handle basically overeating. And then that can cause a lot of uh, different issues. So normally it starts with nutrient burn. That's a uh, you know, tip burn and the edges of the leaf, that type of thing, uh, uh, bronzing, uh, and then can lead to much further uh, aspects of things uh, in terms of locking out other issue, other uh, nutrients, and then causing other symptoms. So that falls under what they call the molders chart. Uh, so nutrients, and that's something you can Google and there's a nice circle that shows all the nutrient interactions. Um, and then just to, to go back to the example of the boron toxicity that we're doing at Niagara College. Um, so boron interacts with uh, potassium. So right now, as we have a toxicity, it's starting to lock out potassium. So we're starting to see those potassium deficiency symptoms. So our thing though, is even though we're seeing potassium deficiency and when we test the app, the app is picking up potassium. It's we're trying to find out what's those key. Sometimes there's maybe a little extra bronzing or the type of how it goes because it's these two, the, the boron tox is toxic as well. We're trying to find those little key features that would distinguish it as a toxicity rather than it's a, it's a potassium deficiency, but that's kind of, it, it falls back to um, that, that molder chart and the nutrient reacting together and, uh, just, you know, having too much of one, uh, will lock out the others. And then you start seeing all sorts of different symptoms. And then that, that is where it gets tricky for home growers or, or growers in general, if they have a lockout to really be able to, to be like, Oh, but I see magnesium deficiency here, but you know, you might be just locked out instead. And then your plant needs a flush or, or that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And like, that just made me think of just cause you mentioned earlier too, like testing the app and identifying these issues in different cultivars like how much of that is a factor like are you seeing a big difference sometimes between how different cultivars it expresses or is it like fairly consistent across the board it's fairly consistent across the board that's what we're seeing there's not too much change um but i mean that's going to change if we started uh you know testing on rudaless uh, or different leaf structure. Let's say we tested on Freak Show. Uh, those types of cultivars are quite different in leaf structure, so that you know we could be different. Um, so we're not quite sure. We're also seeing the similar. I've been looking at uh, uh, grapevines, seeing similarities in magnesium deficiency, for example. Um, looks very similar, and we even tested the app, and the app was diagnosing magnesium in in, in grapevines. So you know, there's a lot of correlation even through plants. Um, yeah, cool. So. So yeah, that's, it's really interesting for us that if it's similar across the board, that means this technology can just be ad adapted to, to work on other crops as well. Okay. Interesting. And, um, I guess like between, um, like identifying diseases or, or pathogens or pests, like, could you rank them in terms of like, which are the easiest, like, which are the hardest for the app? Uh, I, it would, it d depends on what issue. There's some pathogens that, um, 
are easier like powdery mildew those that's a that's one in our sense of what we've collected that's one that we can identify really quickly uh because we collected every stage we've collected just from you know a, a little spot showing on one leaf to mm -hmm. uh the whole leaf being full of powdery mildew so um that one the app has trained and knows very well magnesium deficiency is one that we pick up very very well as well but uh, if we were running to other pathogens um, like fusarium or pythium, those are ones that we haven't touched on yet research wise. So those we have limited data on and the app wouldn't be uh, diagnosing those because it's just the data set's not there for those yet. So that's kind of where we're at. And that's our limitations at this time. But just as we continue doing on that research and, and doing so, um, and, I, and I believe Niagara, uh, Niagara College is going to do those in the month of March. I believe they're going to do uh, a fusarium and, and pithium test. So those are, are, are coming very shortly. But that's so that, kind of, yeah. Yeah, it's sort of like the can of worms you were speaking about. It's sort of like once you have super accurate data and diagnoses for a particular one, there's always going to be almost like another disease right. another pathogen to, to like get some solid, like a solid foundation baseline, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess just like regarding integrated pest management in general, like it's a huge topic in cannabis, like everyone wants like good, clean product and product that is like high quality, but also too obviously able to pass the, the analytical tests and integrated pest management is obviously a critical um, component of that. So like any tips, I guess, like as someone who's sort of heavily involved in that, that aspect of it, like what are, what are some tips that you might have for someone who's just starting up a, a new IPM program? Like what is it that they should do to, to sort of get it right from the job? Uh, are we speaking more of a home grower or more of somebody in a facility? I would say more on like the, the facility side. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the facility side, it definitely be crucial to um, talk to uh, someone that's in in biological controls, if that's the way you're going. Uh, I mean, that seems to be the organic route. If you're growing organic soil, that type of, your market seems to be wanting more of the organic. So uh, definitely talk to a biological expert that could recommend the right uh, insects for you along your grow. I know Niagara College, even though they don't have anything, there's always some biological controls in the, their, their, their facility, their canna bunkers, just so uh, you know, they're on, on top of things and you, know, you don't let things get out of hand. Uh, you know, thrips reproduce very quickly and uh, spider mites, aphids as well. It's just, it's, it's a cycle that, that moves quickly. They go unidentified, they're under the leaves, they're hiding on the plant. And then all of you know, by the time you notice it, it might be too late. So it's just, it's really good to be ahead. And if you're going to spray that sort of thing, just, you know, have it, have a, a schedule on, on point. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, IPM experts out there like uh, Sync Angel, uh, gives a lot of good information on, on Instagram and on, on, he's on, on LinkedIn as well. So follow, uh, some IPM specialist and, you know, have a kind of checklist and, and go through on, on a weekly basis. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess like you can look at the app as basically another tool in the toolbox of a, of, of an IPM system. Like it's not meant to necessarily replace uh, the integrated pest management system, but it's, it's going to help out a lot, right? Especially when those, those, you know, bigger problems arise potentially. Right. Yeah. So right now we're, we're more of a, a tool, like a hammer to help you. Uh, but as we move forward, uh, we have plans to even just work with the panoramic uh, picture on, on an iPhone or, or Google phone uh, where you'll be able to just, you know, scan your crop and we'll be able to pick out if we see uh, an aphid or a threat or spider mice or, or a deficiency or something. Right. So it making it easier to scout, just basically walking through, taking those panorama shots, that sort of thing. Uh, and as well as uh, basically um, insect count on sticky traps. That's something that we'll have in, in the near future as well. So uh, counting how many fungus gnats were caught, thrips, that sort of thing. So those are, are things that we're, we're adding on to our system and to, to help the growers with with a great tool that can you know, help them save time and, you know, just have a, a better process all along that, uh, that, that, that any tasks necessary are, are always done on time and, and done in the right order so that they can ensure that, the, you know, they're not having a devastation in terms of their yield or, the, or their crop. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, a lot of, a lot of potential, a lot of like, there's so much room to grow, I guess, right. Mm -hmm. In terms of like where this could really end up and, um, it, it's cool to be at sort of the precipice of that and, and seeing it, it come along because like it just has so much potential, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, 
So, yeah, I mean, I guess other than that, like, where can, can people find you? Like, tell us about the app. Like, what is sort of the, the process of getting signed up with, with GrowDoc and how can people get in touch with you and, and what does that look like? Yeah, so right now our app it was for home growers uh, and it's available in the Google Play and App Store uh, for free. And there's a, a premium version if you don't want to wait for the ads and that sort of thing. Uh, in terms of uh, micros, LPs, uh, MSOs, the, the, the facility growers, uh, we're working on a system for you guys right now, uh, basically taking our existing software and, and the apps, but putting those in a tracking system. Uh, and then not only are we building our own tracking system, but we're focusing our tracking system to be integrated into uh, the seed to sale or farm management system that are out there right now. So in terms of you can connect what you've already got going on to GrowDoc to be able to uh, take a picture of a plant and maybe scan a QR code if that's kind of how you're scanning your, your plants and then be able to log that information and track it into your existing system. That we're kind of taking the diagnosis and then we're adding that to the tracking as well. Cool. So yeah, so applications both for the home growers and the uh, and the LP side. So yeah, um, so that's great that you have both options there. Well, we'll have a, a link to that in the in the description below, so people can check that out and and get in touch. But um, yeah, amazing. Thank you so much for for explaining the app. It sounds so cool. Um, it's 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 really fascinating to see how AI is going to be integrating into the cannabis industry, and um, you know, hopefully not like skynetting and and taking over or anything. Uh, but I don't see that happening. Not here. yet. No. Yeah. Not yet. It's nice that this has sort of a, a useful function to it. Um, and it's trying to help growers out. So that's, that's critical. Um, and again, another, another tool in the toolbox is always helpful. So Daniel, I really appreciate it. Thank you for, for joining us today. And um, yeah, thanks again and have a great rest of your day. I thank you so much for your time and thanks for having me. Take care. Thank you for tuning into this episode of High Fidelity. For access to the entire Cannabis 360 catalog, subscribe at canna360.ca or visit our YouTube channel, Canna360.